the cataphract, the super heavy tank of the ancient world. These elite armored horsemen were legendary for shattering lines, rallying armies, and charging down elephants one on one. They had a long history which spanned many civilizations over the centuries and eventually gave rise to the Knights of the Middle Ages. It is a long, fascinating tradition that is too expansive to cover all at once. Today, we will be looking at one specific incarnation of these formidable warriors in the form of the Roman cataphracts of the 1st to 5th centuries AD. Through this episode, we'll be getting a taste of the history of the late Roman Empire, in particular the East. However, you can explore much more of this fascinating period and region through our sponsor, Wondrium. Wondrium offers subscription-based on-demand videos covering a huge range of subjects from history to science, travel, art, hobbies, and more. These come delivered in a variety of packages, from your more academic courses to well-produced documentaries, exclusives, and more. Their platform has been my go-to source for background research while making my own documentaries, and I've learned a ton. Of the many series I love, The Roman Empire, presented by Dr. Gregory Aldrit, has to be one of my favorites. Lecture 14, for instance, explores the crisis of the 3rd century and the reforms which transformed the empire. My mind was blown by how just a few tweaks here and there by key figures so drastically alter the course of history. Right now, Wondrium is offering a free trial, which you can start by clicking the link in the description below or visiting wondrium.com invicta. I highly recommend that you take a look at what they have to offer and dive into the material that you are most interested in. Enjoy! The evolution of cavalry forces had long been pioneered by the peoples of the East. It was here, in the steppes, plateaus and plains, that Bronze Age tribes had taken the first trots into mounted warfare. Light cavalry were naturally the first onto the scene, but in the ensuing arms race these were quickly being upgraded with increasing levels of weapons and armor. Owing to the nature of their lifestyle, the nomadic tribes were always on the forefront of innovation, but sometimes lacked the resources of settled societies to provide sufficient gear for their troops. Thus it was that civilizations, which straddled both groups, had the reason and the means to evolve. The Assyrians were one such early civilization which began to pioneer in the realm of armored cavalry. During the period of antiquity, this torch would largely be passed to the Archaemenids, who successfully leveraged cavalry to form one of the largest empires of its day. While their approach to warfare admittedly involved a variety of troop types, their tradition of mounted nobility proved particularly influential to the emergence of later cataphracts. For instance, it was the units of elite Persian kinsmen which inspired the Macedonians of the West to form their own elite ranks of companion cavalry. While not particularly heavily armored, these nonetheless advanced the cause of heavy cavalry by demonstrating the effectiveness of mounted shock tactics, first against the Greeks and then against the Persians themselves. More importantly though, in the wake of Alexander's conquests came a merging of many Eastern and Western traditions, particularly in the realm of mounted warfare. This had begun quite literally with Alexander as he sought to absorb former Archaemenid troops into his armies. The trend would continue upon his death with the successors who now ruled as Hellenistic monarchs over the various satrapies. The Seleucids, for example, fully embraced the adoption of heavy cavalry forces, with Antiochus the Great fielding the first recorded cataphractoi in his campaigns. Described by Livy as horsemen in complete armor, equipped with long lances, these quickly proved their superiority in battle and were adopted by the other major powers vying for control of the East. The Romans, meanwhile, were largely ignorant of these developments. Long accustomed to winning victories with infantry forces, they were in for a rude awakening as the Republic expanded its way East. 
This first began in the 200s BC with the wars against the Hellenistic powers. Here, the legions got their first taste of cataphract units, fielded by the Seleucids at the battles of Thermopylae and Magnesia. While these certainly made an impression, they were handicapped by poor conditions and proved unable to halt the Roman advance. However, the odds would change as the legions pushed further into the heartland of the horse lords. King of them all would be the Parthians, who fielded entire armies of cavalry. When war broke out in the first century BC, the power of such forces in the open field would soon become self-evident. The lesson would most brutally be taught at the Battle of Carre in 53 BC. It was here that seven legions came face to face with 1,000 cataphracts backed up by 9,000 horse archers and light cavalry. The slow-moving legions were surrounded, picked apart by arrow fire, and inevitably crushed by the charge of the heavy cavalry. This disaster convinced the Romans that they had to evolve. Thus began the start of their gradual adaptation to the ways of the East. The first step would be to diversify their roster by adding a greater proportion of both ranged and mounted troops. However, the Italian forces were in no position to take up this task themselves. They therefore relied on foreign allies and auxiliaries for the job. In this manner, Rome was able to wage more successful Eastern campaigns. With regards to cataphract forces specifically, we first hear of these fighting under a Roman banner during the Great Jewish Revolt of the 1st century AD. Here, Josephus gives the following description of an assault against a breach at the siege of Jotapata in 68 AD. Quote, Vespasian made the most courageous of the horsemen get off their horses and placed them in three ranks against the ruins of the wall. They were covered with armor on every side and with contoy in their hands. It is likely that these cataphracts were not a part of the Roman military proper, but were rather allied troops sent by local kings to aid in Vespasian's war against the rebelling Jews. Their presence is a clear indication that the Roman commanders were at least beginning to toy with the use of super-heavy cavalry units in their armies. For now, though, cataphracts remained an ad hoc tool deployed in a sporadic fashion. Yet the longer Rome battled against mounted forces, the greater the pressures became for the legions to adopt more permanent cavalry solutions. However, this was a slow process. Our records indicate that the first true body of Roman cataphracts would not be implemented until around 130 AD during the reign of Emperor Hadrian. Officially named the Alla I Galorum et Pannoniorum Cataphracta, these were a regular unit of auxiliary cavalry stationed in Mysia Inferior. Little is known about them other than that they were created as a counter to the emerging Sarmatian threat on this frontier. These steppe forces were feared as expert riders who fought atop steeds with extensive armor, long lances, and bows. The auxiliaries are thus likely to have tried to at least match some level of this gear set. However, what few written and pictorial records remain seem to indicate that they were only partially armored at this point and did not yet fully reflect the image one has of proper cataphract units. It will be appropriate at this point to briefly discuss why this was the case. The first point to make is that such extensive armor was costly to produce and maintain. In addition, its added weight required a suitably sturdy breed of horse, which was hard to come by. Even steeds which could bear the burden would be slow and quick to tire. Likewise, an armored rider would also be prone to fatigue and struggle to maintain his stability in an age before the adoption of stirrups and high-backed saddles. Therefore, it proved simply more practical to adopt strategically placed partial armor to get the job done without risking the downsides of a full set. Thus, the Roman cataphractarii 
of this early period adopted the iconic title of the unit without truly living up to its name. The real cataphracts in their employ would continue to be foreign troops such as the Sarmatian Auxiliaries, which served as far away as Britain. Yet, as Rome settled into its occupation of the East, its own units of cataphracts would slowly mature. As had happened before, though, this change would largely take place in reaction to the development of others. For example, the rise of the Sassanids once again rekindled the evolutionary arms race along this frontier. It was they who relied heavily on a diversified cavalry corps, which now featured the Klebanarioi, meaning oven man in Greek. These forces were completely covered in armor, from head to toe and mane to tail. Facing the brunt of their attacks would be the forces of Palmyra. As Easterners themselves, they had their own cavalry tradition, which could produce similarly equipped super-heavy units. These helped hold the Sassanids at bay and later allowed the Palmyrenes to briefly break away from the Roman Empire during the crisis of the third century. However, when Emperor Aurelian helped restore order, he would set off to reclaim the East from Queen Zenobia. The two sides would clash at the battles of Imai and Emisa. In both cases, Palmyrene Klebanarii crushed their opposition in a head-on fight but were ultimately defeated when tired out by a lengthy pursuit and overwhelmed by reinforcements. In the aftermath, Palmyra would be destroyed and its lands recovered. In the process, Rome would absorb its armed forces and inherit the use of the Klebanarii. Proper cataphracts were finally here to stay. Let us now take a closer look at these forces. To capture the evolution of these units, I would like to review the equipment of both early and later Roman cataphracts. As mentioned previously, the younger variants, referred to as cataphractarii, were generally less well equipped. For defense, the horse likely only had partial barding wrapped around its chest. This would typically have been bronze or iron scale armor, which was worked into the backing of a leather garment. Other times, plated or lamellar armor could be used. On their backs would be affixed the traditional four-horned saddle used by the Romans. Riders, meanwhile, also donned defensive gear. Primarily, this involved a mail or scale shirt with greaves, arms guards, and a helmet. Funerary carvings indicate that this headgear could be ornately decorated with mask coverings that mimicked a human face. For offense, their primary weapon was the contos, a four-meter-long two-handed lance. Unlike one-handed spears used by most of their contemporaries, the force behind the weighty contos could easily fell men and horses in a single blow. By some accounts, it was even capable of piercing two layers of chainmail. As a backup, riders commonly carried a spartha sword and a dagger at their side. Over time, however, as the cataphractarii were reinforced or replaced by the clebanarii, the gear of these new units would become more elaborate. For defense, horses wore the same type of armor but expanded it to cover the full body. This was not done with a single piece, but rather with sections to maintain the animal's mobility. Special armor was also crafted to fit around a horse's neck and even its head. We even have records that the feet of the horses could also be plated, so as to protect them from caltrops. As one can imagine, this was all highly specialized and expensive gear. No citizen could personally afford such items, let alone maintain them over long periods, and therefore it was the state which increasingly sponsored their kits. To this end, Diocletian ordered the construction of two new armor foundries, specifically for the fabrication of cataphract armor, bringing the total number of known specialized workshops 
up to a grand total of just four across the entire Roman Empire. Not to be outdone, the riders were similarly well protected. A lamellar cuirass, supplemented by mail at the joints, protected their chest. Their arms and legs were covered in segmented plate, and they wore ridge-style plumed helmets with either cheek plates and a full face mask, or a chain aventail that left only their eyes exposed. Even their feet were encased in armoured sabatons. For offence, they primarily carried the same Contos lance as before. Some additional innovations, however, had been used to give it better support for rest and restraint that allowed the rider to maintain control of his weapon even in the most violent of clashes. The rest of their gear seems to have come in two basic forms. The Scutarii Clibanarii were more attuned for melee combat with shields and spartha swords or maces. The Sagittarii Clibanarii, in contrast, were outfitted for ranged combat with a composite bow and no shield. This distinction, however, is likely not that important, as Clibanarii can be seen mixing and matching all kinds of items on the battlefield. It should also be noted that these super-heavy units existed alongside a huge diversity of other Roman cavalry, whose lack of uniformity meant that any efforts to define clear-cut sets of equipment is likely a futile effort. That being said, we can move on. In terms of recruitment, there is again some difference between the early and later periods. In the age of the Cataphractarii, their horses and riders were generally drawn from eastern or steppe sources. In the age of the Clebanarii, however, they might have come from across the empire. For example, from our limited sources on named cataphract units, several appear to tie back to places of Gallic origin. This may have been a result of the veteran colonies of Sarmatian men who had been settled in those areas and had a pre-existing tradition of horsemanship. Some sources mention that units should be raised in tribal groups for better cohesion, yet it was rare that one could simply recruit a cataphract unit all at once. They took years to outfit and train properly. For example, the military records of Serapium, a Romano-Egyptian cavalry officer living in the late 4th century, indicates that promotion into the Ali of the Cataphractarii was the culmination of a cavalryman's career. Ten years of outstanding service was needed just for the recommendation to join the cataphracts. These men simply had to be the best of the best to be at all effective. As a result, they were few in number. Units, for instance, were typically made up of around 300 riders. Each had its own overall commander and likely wing officers, with each squad of eight men being led by a decurium. The Notitia Dignitatum from the 4th century lists some 19 units of Roman cataphractarii and clebanarii. That gives us a generous max of around 5,700 riders for the entire empire. In reality, though, those are paper strength numbers, which count all units which the author was aware of having existed. Thus, the true strength of Rome's cataphracts were likely far lower at any given time, with no more than 1,000 congregating at a time. These were rare but powerful units. As such, we see them primarily deployed along the empire's most contentious fronts. Initially, cataphracts only appeared in field armies, with no particular honour attached to them outside of their already elite status. The Notitia Dignitatum references 15 as being in the east and 4 in the west. Presumably, this balance would have shifted over time. However, it increasingly became the practice of the cataphracts to serve as elite imperial guard units who travelled with the later emperors, such as Constantine, rather than remaining in one place at a time. With this understanding, let us now talk about their training and tactics. 
Once more, little can be said definitely about the inner workings of such a rare unit. We can assume that each group of recruits trained in accordance with their native traditions. Upon entering the Roman military, this may have been refined by a certain degree of standardization. This would involve conditioning, basic drills, formation practice, and perhaps even mock battles. However, the true training would come from combat itself. As we mentioned, the cataphracts were usually the best of the best who had lived a lifetime of active duty to achieve this honored position. As for how they fought, they would usually be deployed out front to act as a mailed fist that would break enemy lines. Little could stop them due to their armor and crushing mass. Thus, they might be tasked with cracking a flank or going straight for the head of the snake with an attack on an enemy's commander. On the advance, they would advance at the trot to preserve their cohesion and strength. Only the last moments before impact might see them increase their speed. At this point, momentum and huge lances would see them crash upon the ranks of the foe to brutal effect. Few could withstand a direct charge. This was what the cataphracts counted on. Their heavy armor meant they tired quickly in battle and could not sustain combat over long periods. This naturally posed a great risk. A competent commander would seek to mitigate the threat by pairing them with supporting units of light cavalry and horse archers. Such ranged units might even be cataphracts themselves. Together, they projected a formidable threat on the battlefield. For a more grounded description of their use, we can now turn to a record of their service history. We will pick up where we left off with the defeat of Palmyra and the restoration of the Roman Empire by Aurelian in the late third century AD. Though his achievements were certainly praiseworthy, they could not forever hold the realm's enemies at bay. For instance, his assassination in 275 led to another rapid succession of leaders whose chaotic rule only served to embolden attacks from inside and out. Against these would stand the cataphracts. Unfortunately, we have only sporadic mentions of their activities and are left to guess at an overall narrative. Broadly speaking, this would have meant fighting along the various theatres of war across the empire. In the east, this involved fighting against the cavalry heavy forces of the steppe and the Sassanid Empire. However, by this point, the Roman army was well adapted to mounted warfare. Its number of medium, heavy and super heavy cavalry seems to have swelled with new recruitment and organizational efforts that now allowed them to fight with greater parity. Thus armed, they were even able to launch several campaigns deep into Mesopotamia, which saw the capital of Ctesiphon sacked on multiple occasions. Even when the Sassanids brought to bear their war elephants, this could not stop the cataphracts. Vegetius gives the following description in his book De Re Militari. Quote, Pairs of cataphract horses were harnessed each to a chariot. Mounted on the horses were cataphract cavalrymen, who aimed sarissas at the elephants. Being covered in iron, they were not harmed by the archers riding the beasts and avoided their charges thanks to the speed of their horses. Such tactics are also mentioned in the Notitia Dignitatum and other sources. Apparently, this was not just some theoretical scenario or flight of fancy. Somewhere, somehow, man, horse, and rickety contraption charged an elephant in the middle of battle under the raging heat of the oriental sun, and they won. Elsewhere, across the empire, cataphracts were also fighting with equal bravery. By the close of the third century AD, Diocletian would institute the Tetrarchy and a series of military reforms. These would see a significant uptick in the funding and recruitment of the army alongside various organizational changes. 
It is likely that the various units of the Cataphractarii and the Clebanarii would have benefited from such actions, but again, we are left largely in the dark regarding specifics. We next hear of them in our records at the Battle of Turin in 312 AD. It was here that Constantine and Maxentius first clashed in their climactic contest for the throne, which would eventually end at the Milvian Bridge. For now, Constantine had with him 40,000 men and a mix of light to medium cavalry. The usurper Maxentius, meanwhile, deployed a larger force of some 70,000 men, along with several units of heavily armored cavalry. Here is an evocative description of these forces on the battlefield. Quote, so many soldiers filled the open plain that he who saw them arrayed would not fault their confidence. What a spectacle that is said to have been. How dreadful to behold, how terrible, horses and men alike enclosed in a covering of iron. In the army, they are called clebanarii. The men are covered with mail in the upper part, a corselet which extends down to the horses' chests and hangs to their forelegs, protects them from injury of a wound without impeding their gait. Nevertheless, neither the fact that their armor doubled the terror inspired by so large a number, nor that numbers added force to their arms frightened you, Emperor. This obvious propaganda piece goes on to praise Constantine in fawning terms for raising the spirits of his men and imbuing them with the fire of courage to withstand the charge of the enemy. Apparently, this came in the form of a massed, mailed wedge launched by Maxentius, straight at the center of the emperor's battle line. However, he seems to have been prepared with a counter tactic. I'll now return to our sources. Quote, but you, most prudent emperor who knew all the ways of fighting, got assistance from your ingenuity. That it is safest to avoid a crashing tide than to stand against it. By drawing your lines apart, you induced an enemy attack which could not be reversed. And by leading your lines back together, you hemmed in the men whom you had allowed into your trap. It did them no good to press forward. Since your men purposely gave way, Iron's rigidity did not allow a change in direction for pursuit. Thus, our men assailed those who were delivered to them with clubs equipped with heavy iron knobs, which wore out an invulnerable enemy with their beating. Where the riders were struck in the head, they tumbled down, dazed and defeated. Then, they all began to fall headlong, to slide down backward, to totter half dead or dying, to be held fast by their saddles, to lie entangled in the confused slaughter of horses, which in unbridled pain, when their vulnerable points had been discovered, cast riders everywhere. When all had been killed to a man and your soldiers were untouched, people transferred the horror inspired by their armor to wonder at the victory because those who were considered invulnerable had died without wounding anyone on your side. The battle showed that while cataphracts were considered by many to be invincible, in reality, those familiar with their weaknesses could neutralize them. As demonstrated, this involved a combination of a feigned flight combined with attacks from the flank and a prolonged fight in close quarters. However, the rarity of the cataphracts was their strength. Only peoples who had fought them for extended periods of time worked out their weaknesses. Thus, they continued to see use in the Roman army of the 4th century. Constantine himself contributed significantly to their institutional permanence through the creation of various workshops and the founding of the Scola Scutariorum, Clebanariorum. His heirs, too, carried on this tradition by leveraging the cataphract units against various rebel and barbarian threats. 
For example, at the Battle of Mursa in 351, Emperor Constantius II would finally claim victory thanks to the combined efforts of both bow-armed and lance-armed Clebanarii. Five years later, Emperor Julian would ride down an army of Alamanni using his elite cataphractarii at the Battle of Autun in 356 AD. Two years after this, they would meet again at the Battle of Strasbourg. Here, the Romans deployed roughly 15,000 men with a force of around 3,000 cavalry consisting largely of the cataphractarii. The Alamanni had nearly twice that number of infantry but feared losing the cavalry fight. Their commander therefore interspersed light infantry among his riders on one flank while anchoring his other flank against the woods. When fighting broke out, the imperial cataphracts initially landed a punishing blow. However, once locked in a confused melee, the Alamanni light troops could slip unnoticed amidst their ranks, gutting horses from below and pulling down riders to finish them off on the ground. The casualties quickly mounted, leading the cavalry to rout. However, once these had reached the relative safety of their reserves, they were able to rally, reform, and charge back into the fray to relieve the main body of Roman infantry. This disciplined and timely return now allowed them to break the Alamanni and win a great victory. Just a few years later, the cataphracts would again ride to the rescue of Roman infantry, this time surrounded by Anglo-Saxons. Here, the barbarians stood no chance against the mailed fist of Rome and were massacred to a man. Thus was the empire kept safe from another invasion for another year. However, strength of arms alone was not enough to save the West. Beset by numerous ills and sent into a terminal decline, it would finally fall. Yet the cataphract would remain in service past the death of the old world, enduring well into the new age that was to come as the proper horse breeding techniques, armor crafting skills, and new technology came into play, they would only become more deadly. Join us next time as we follow these warriors from the twilight of antiquity and into the thunderous charges of the Middle Ages under the banner of the Byzantines. For now, we hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into the history of the cataphracts of the Roman Empire. Let us know what units we should cover next. A huge thanks to the patrons for funding the channel and to the researchers, writers and artists for making this episode possible. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content and check out these other related episodes. See you in the next one.